Welcome to The Sound of Economics, the podcast series by Brugge, the Brussels-based economic think tank. I'm Giuseppe Porcaro, Head of Outreach and Governance. And I'm Gunther Wolf. And uh, we are here today to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on emerging economies and the corresponding policy responses. And we are very happy to host from uh, not only the other, side of the, uh, the other side of the Atlantic, but actually uh, far, uh, far, far west on, on the west coast, Barry Eichegreen, who is professor of economics and political science at the University of California, Berkeley. Barry is a, a very renewed academics and uh, is an expert on global economics, uh, European integration, and economic history. But I leave the floor to Guntram to, uh, to have a, a little introduction about uh, the topic of today. Well, uh, let me also thank you, Barry, for joining us today. I mean, this is uh, it's great to have you um, in this evening and this morning um, uh, for you um, here in, in Brussels, in Europe, but also in the World Wide Web. Um, we are discussing today the topic of um, emerging uh, market economies. Uh, where are they currently in this pandemic and what's going to happen next? Um, we have seen um, in the last couple of weeks not only a dramatic um, economic uh, shock to advanced economies, we have also seen that um, emerging economies have seen a massive capital outflow. Um, uh, the estimates of the International Institute of Finance suggest that more than 100 billion in portfolio uh, uh, flows have been flowing out um, of, of emerging market economies in the course of only 45 days or something like this. Um, this is a much steeper decline and outflow of capital than what we've seen um, in the previous great financial crisis around 2008-9. And we've seen uh, initiatives by the G20. We've seen calls for debt relief, even by Pope Francis, who called for debt relief um, for uh, the um, uh, poor countries in the world. So, so Barry, perhaps let me, let me shoot my first question to you. Where, where do we stand with the emerging uh, markets, the emerging economies in the world in this crisis? Where, where are they? Thank you, Guntram. I think there's an unfortunate tendency for those of us in the global north to pay disproportionate attention to our crisis. The crisis in Italy has been horrific, but there is the danger of an even more serious crisis in the global south. So I think of this as a, a, a problem with at least five dimensions. You mentioned one of them, Guntram, that there have been these massive portfolio capital outflows in the first month five times the magnitude of uh, portfolio capital outflows experienced by emerging markets in the first quarter of the 2008-2009 financial crisis, so much more serious this time. Secondly, the, the trade collapse. So everyone is guessing by how much and for how long trade will collapse, but the World Trade Organization is guessing that there will be a decline of 32% in the, uh, the volume of, of global trade this year compared to a mere 12% in 2008, 2009. Um, third, there's the difficulty of doing a lockdown in a country like India. We've seen vivid images of that already, but it's a more general point whether you, you live in Mumbai or whether you live in a favela in Rio. Um, there, number four, there's the collapse of re remittances. So uh, the World Bank guesses that these will fall this year by $110 billion. So again, at least as important as the portfolio capital outflow that you flagged before, and number five, there's the commodity price collapse. Uh, everybody has noticed uh, oil. Uh, developing countries uh, could see their oil and gas income fall by, wait for it, 50 to 85% this year. 
according to, to OPEC. And there are lots of other commodities that will be negatively uh, affected as well. Emerging markets and low-income countries have weaker health systems than uh, the advanced countries. There are 10 uh, sub-Saharan African countries that, uh, as far as I know, with zero ventilators, zero. Uh, they're in, in, in the weakest position to win the uh, competitive struggle for PPE. Uh, they are in, in, in the weakest position to get their hands on vaccines if and when those become available. They have the advantage that they've put in place um, public health uh, administrations to deal with the Ebola and uh, AIDS uh, epidemics uh, that do them some good, I think, under these circumstances. But they have the, uh, the problem in the short run of limited fiscal space mm. compared to what we enjoy in the North. They have limited ability to issue and fund uh, government debt in their own currencies. Um, they have limited ability to in, in, engage in quantitative easing and expand their central bank balance sheets because of the, the danger of more currency depreciation, which can be destabilizing given that much of their external debt is denominated in, uh, in dollars. Uh, the ex, uh, external debt denominated in dollars in emerging markets, excluding China, has doubled since 2008. So everybody talks about the uh, end of original sin, the idea that uh, emerging markets can only issue debt in uh, foreign currency. Well, it's ended for governments, but not for the corporates. And now the problem of, uh, problems of the corporates have become problems of, of the public sector mm. as well. Uh, these countries uh, in many cases have slim to no foreign reserves. So Turkey and South Africa are running out. And I think in the longer run, there are uh, challenges, bleak prospects, weak global demand will persist, reshoring and shortened supply chains will hinder the division, uh, global division of labor. There'll be more impetus in the North to develop and, and apply robotics and art, artificial intelligence, which will be bad for assembly operations and in, in low income economies, meaning premature industrialization. And there will be heavier debts in hmm. the low income world as well. So there's lots to talk about. Well, uh, thank you for this first overview, uh, Barry, and, uh, and indeed uh, uh, very, very uh, big dimensions that, that you open up here. I took notes, capital outflows, trade collapse, the difficulties of actually doing lockdown, uh, the collapse of remittances, um, and commodity prices as sort of five main drivers uh, that we certainly need to, to look, uh, look at in more detail and that I, I would love to actually talk about each of them individually. But, but perhaps before we zoom in a bit more on some of those, I don't think we will manage all of them. Uh, uh, perhaps a, a general uh, a remark. I mean, is, is this perhaps a description that um, is, uh, can be phrased in much more general terms as saying the pandemic actually affects the poor much more than the rich and including the poor in advanced economies. I mean, the poor in advanced economies, they find it, uh, have a much harder time doing the lockdown measures. They, they don't have a house with a garden. They have to live in a small apartment. They can't get out. They um, they uh, have to go to work because they have no savings. Um, so is this really perhaps a way of framing this also instead of saying it's just an emerge it's a big emerging market problem. It's an emerging problem, but it's really a problem of poverty. Um, is that a way of uh, phrasing it? It's a problem of poverty and it's a problem of inequality. We are reminded of that now every day in the United States, where there are many people without health insurance, where it tends to be the, uh, the um, people with the lowest incomes who are on, uh, on the front lines uh, of delivering the groceries and doing the logistics, partly because they have to go to work to put the basics, to put food on the table, where um, the 
wealthier are uh, evacuating to their country homes on Long Island. So um, in, in, in the United States, that has uh, reminded us of the, the gaps, the holes in the social safety net. What is true here, I think, is true in, in many countries. So it's true of um, migrant workers in Singapore. We've uh, been reminded of that case recently as well. And I think it's true of uh, across countries also that when the pandemic eventually gets to sub-Saharan Africa, we will be reminded that the impact, alas, unfortunately, could be even more devastating there than it is here where we have stronger public health systems and greater ability to lock down. Okay, so, so let's perhaps talk a bit about, uh, about the issue, um, zooming in a bit more on the, on the macro uh, finance front. I mean, we've seen the collapse of, um, uh, of remittances, which means less funding available for the economies um, in the, emer the emerging economies. We've seen uh, a withdrawal of portfolio investments, and we are seeing also collapse in trade, meaning also less revenues uh, for these countries to actually uh, service their debt. Um, so, so uh, how how would you um, uh, judge um, the response, uh, the global response to uh, essentially this lack of fund, both in terms of short-term liquidity, but also probably in terms of uh, longer-term solvency issues uh, so far? I mean, we've seen the G20 uh, giving some debt relief. Um, it's still being debated, um, the precise uh, uh, outline, but there is some initiative here. Uh, we've seen um, some swap lines, liquidity swap lines um, provided uh, to countries like Indonesia, um, uh, um, but not, not many actually. And we've seen, um, I think more than 100 uh, countries um, have um, inquired and uh, whether or not they, they could get some assistance from the International Monetary Fund. Um, and of course, the World Bank is also being approached. So, so on the whole, I mean, how do you see uh, currently um, the the policy response um, to the emerging markets to this liquidity and solvency challenge uh, of external debt and external equity, and what else should be done? So the shock, Guntram, that you describe is a sudden stop in uh, capital flows and resource flows to emerging markets in developing countries. This is the mother of all sudden stops. Never in recorded history, I think, have we seen a, a sudden stop like this. So I have a, a economic history article from five years ago about the sudden stop at the beginning of the Great Depression called the mother of all sudden stops. This is larger relative to the affected economies. How do I judge the response um, half-baked and underwhelming at this point. The uh, only reassurance is that we're still early in, uh, in the process, that uh, officials have only begun to recognize how uh, big the hit affecting emerging markets and developing countries are. And historically, we know it always takes them time to get their minds around the problem and, and organize a response. So um, what's been done so far is analogous to what was done in the early stages of the Latin American debt crisis in the 1980s, namely uh, to ask creditors for forbearance, in other words, to uh, not demand immediately, immediate uh, payment of interest and uh, uh, repayment of, of principal on what's been borrowed, and to ask banks where banks are involved to roll over their maturing loans. So that was what was done at the beginning of the Latin American debt crisis in the hope that the crisis would be short-lived and countries would grow out of it. It wasn't short-lived and it wasn't possible for countries to grow out of it. So after seven years, the Baker plan was succeeded by the Brady plan, which recognized the need for debt reduction and converted debt into uh, 
equity-like bond, basically bonds, but uh, other longer-term instruments. So we're going to have to do debt forgiveness and debt restructuring this time as well. So all that has been done so far is uh, for the uh, the poorest countries, uh, official bilateral debts, in other words, government to government uh, loans ha have been uh, uh, basically halted. Um, China has exempted itself unilaterally from this process. So it's it has lent uh, a bunch of countries money big time through Belt and Road but it announced after the, 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 the group of 20 uh, meeting that debt relief is not applicable to uh, Belt and Road loans extended by the China Export-Import Bank. So uh, not a whole lot has been done there. Uh, there was a call for um, not only governments, but private creditors to uh, ag agree to a standstill on repayments. But there's an interesting question about how such a call can be answered and whether there's a way to uh, implement that standstill. Uh, the International Monetary Fund has uh, established uh, programs for uh, at, I think 40 countries, 40 at last count, more mm -hmm. every day. Uh, it has a new facility uh, to basically supplement Federal Reserve dollar swap lines and treasury repos, but only for countries with impeccably strong policies. And, and uh, a lot of people think that uh, facility will, will never be used, that countries with impeccably strong policies have reserves of dollars and don't need it, and the rest can't access it. There has been $14 billion of new World Bank funds for crisis relief efforts. So mm -hmm. I under, underline that number again, 14 billion? <laughs> if, I, if I may jump, uh, we are starting to get some questions from our audience. I would like to remind to the listeners that uh, they can ask questions on Slido, slide.do, and that the code is emerging. Um, so there is a, a listener who is asking how the fragility of the multilateral system affect the possibility of a coordinated response to such a problem with poverty and inequality that uh, you have been outlining just before. And somehow it, it blends a little bit in what you were telling just before about the reaction of certain countries and um, the risk that they are here in terms of coordination. Fragility of the multilateral system is a polite way of putting it. it, it, it the, listen, the, listener, the listener was a diplomatic one. Coordination internationally, globally is fraught under the best circumstances and these are not the best circumstances. So how we can coordinate, coordinate on developing uh, a vaccine and on, on public health responses without the constructive participation of the United States is not straightforward. How we can agree to the IMF providing more resources to countries in crisis through a new allocation of special drawing rights with the active opposition of the United States hmm. is not hmm. clear. So I think there are a lot of problems we face now like resisting protectionism on uh, health supplies, but more generally, where we need multilateralism and we need cooperation. And the question going forward, I fear, at least through the end of the year, will be, can the world do what it's done uh, with the Paris Climate Accord, which is to continue going forward even without the active participation of the United States? But, but can, Barry, can I ask you and push you a little bit on the G20 um, uh, agreement and also on the role of China? Because you mentioned China is not participating in debt relief when it comes to um, the Belt and Road loans. But China uh, did sign up, in my understanding, to um, the G20 declaration, which was not an easy thing for China, also given that 
um, it has uh, this Paris Club uh, framework of debt relief, which is not really a G20 mechanism. It's much more a G7 um, uh, and uh, Western Western mechanism. So, so how, can can you just say a few more words on uh, how how you you judge? Um, you know, the degree of collaboration by the G20 at this stage. I mean, is the G20 as an institution uh, perhaps back uh, at this stage or is, is that too optimistic of a reading? I did see this morning when I got up that there's a, a nice new Bruegel um, <clears throat> post uh, on this topic, which has a more positive uh, spin on uh, the G20 meeting uh, than I do. It was noted there that uh, the G20 follow-up meeting of leaders as opposed to finance ministers was cancelled. So what the prospects are exactly uh, is far from clear at this point. I do think the declaration that came out of the G20 meeting that uh, said, we will continue to do fiscal stimulus uh, exactly as we had planned to do fiscal stimulus before this meeting, didn't add a lot in terms of, of new initiatives, uh, funding new initiatives via the IMF. There wasn't very much there. Uh, China, as you say, Guntram did uh, agree to a G20 declaration that in, in included the notion of a debt standstill for um, um, emerging markets and developing countries that, that need such a thing. And I do think that was a, a positive indication given that the Paris Club, which is the venue where governments negotiate with other governments about uh, uh, official debt restructuring, that China did, a, did agree to that uh, um, statement was a positive step. But after that agreement, uh, there were statements by Chinese officials saying, uh, uh, of course, this is correct, but it but it doesn't extend to Belt and Road initiatives. But the broader question is right. what the G20 can do going forward. And, and I think there will be an opportunity for it to uh, make constructive statements and take cooperative action on the trade front, resisting protectionism, on the, the non-cooperative scramble for protective equipment, uh, on resisting anti-foreigner, anti-immigrant policies that will depress re re remittances. So I, 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 you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We have to right. see what we can hear. So, so perhaps let us zoom in on one other aspect on the debt relief, and you you mentioned it um, uh, in passing, which is the question of the private sector. I mean, of, obviously, um, official sector loans are only uh, a part of uh, of the debt obligation of emerging markets. Um, uh, in these emerging markets are also have been recipients of private investments. Um, and uh, typically, uh, private investors, uh, of course, uh, don't like to see um, a haircut on their investments. And if the public sector actually gives debt relief, um, it can easily be a debt relief that's going to be very be beneficial to the private sector um, in advanced economies uh, and not at all beneficial to the countries, the emerging countries uh, themselves. So I think one key issue is really um, making sure that the debt relief is not only public debt relief, but um, that the private sector uh, gets involved. Um, where do you see uh, um, us currently on this? Uh, um, what should happen and what do you think will happen, um, especially given, as you said, um, the less than cooperative um, uh, person um, in sitting in Washington? The IMF now has a policy of not lending money to countries simply to pay off their bondholders. Uh, money shouldn't go from taxpayers in our countries to emerging markets in, in order to end up in the pockets of uh, bondholders. So there, there needs to be a, a solution of some sort to that problem. The international policy community started about uh, 20 years ago. I smile when I say that because I, I started writing on this issue uh, 
and the desirability of introducing collective action clauses into bond contracts 25 years ago. And we've come a long ways in terms of doing that. So the typical problem is that bondholders have to agree to a standstill and a restructuring. And there are, are always holdouts who rush to the courthouse and try to seize uh, the, the uh, airliners or oil tankers or other or bank accounts of a government that uh, stops paying interest. So collective action clauses enabled the majority of bondholder of the holders of a bond, 70% of them or something like that, to agree to a write down to a restructuring, preventing the vultures, as they're known from rushing to the courthouse. And there are now aggregation clauses in some bonds that permit one grand vote of all the country's bondholders, preventing a vulture fund from uh, acquiring a, a blocking minority uh, of 30% of its debt or something like that. There are problems with those aggregation clauses. So I think there still needs to be uh, an alternative to this case by case uh, approach. So there is uh, a, a proposal for someone like the G20 or uh, the International Monetary Fund to establish a central credit facility. This is a proposal that comes out of the uh, Center for Economic Policy Research where countries would deposit their interest mm -hmm. and um, that money would be lent back to emerging markets in need until some later date. And the organization responsible for uh, creating that uh, facility like the IMF would effectively give the, uh, the government in question legal protection. I have doubts that that will work legally. Um, the alternative would be for the United Nations to do something here. So back in, I think it was 2003, the United Nations used Article 7 of its charter to shield the government of Iraq from lawsuits by uh, uh, private investors mm. uh, uh, against its non-payment of interest. The UN could take action like that again that might be binding on uh, the uh, U U.S. Federal Court for the Southern District of New York, where these kind of things are litigated. Mm. Mm. And do you think the U.S. president will be supportive uh, of such UN, UN action? Um, I, I, I think it would be a heavy lift, indeed. Okay. But if, you know, if I, I, I think we should start having that discussion. And if, if uh, the U.S. is inclined and able to block action by the UN, we're going to have to go with some kind of ad hoc, more ad hoc approach to this problem, like the uh, central credit facility suggested by the CEPR academics. Uh, Barry, we have now quite a bunch of questions. I, I would like to, um, to ask you something that is coming from Maria de Merzis. She is uh, asking if you would be willing to take a shot at what a new normal would look like. Uh, and she, she speculates, is, is it going to be more monitoring and tracking, less international cooperation, more protectionism? What, what could look like? That's the big question all of us are asking and none of us can answer. Um, because the answer depends in part on the virus. Uh, number one, we're, uh, those of us uh, on this call are not epidemiologists. And number two, even the epidemiologists don't know how the virus will be affected by uh, warmer weather, how, how intense it, its return will be in the fall, uh, how many times it will return, how long it will take to the uh, uh, discovery and manufacturing of a vaccine. So I, I, I think it's very hard to know. My guess would be that uh, the kind of situation we're in at the moment will uh, 
is the new normal, which in, in, involves efforts to preserve the multilateral system, including international trade and, and, and finance and uh, uh, immigration for work remittances, but that nationalist forces are strengthened by these kind of crises where uh, it becomes tempting to focus on, on helping your nationals, helping your residents and to point fingers at foreigners as uh, the source of the problem. Every economist I know at this point talks about the importance uh, of uh, massive increases in, in, in testing and the ability to trace, to track and quarantine as a precondition for uh, restoring a semblance of mm. normal. And I think it's a precondition in particular for uh, it, uh, globalization as we know it surviving. Actually, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic about some aspects of globalization. In terms of trade, I'm reminded of the uh, conversations we were having after 9-11, where in the United States, lots of people said, now it's gonna be too risky to have uh, international air travel and to have large scale international trade. So for better or for worse, we got the Transportation Safety Administration and figured out how to screen people coming in and into the country. And we figured out how to x-ray containers when they were unloaded at ports. Trade and tourism survived that event. And I think we can use technology uh, in the wake of this one in, in ways that will be supportive uh, of globalization as well. I mean, if we, uh, if we can think a bit further, further ahead, um, uh, I think uh, you described very nicely the on and off period. And I think this will be um, a very strange period, uh, a new normal, but uh, let's hope that eventually um, we will uh, succeed in um, uh, combating the virus and actually become uh, a world without uh, such a virus um, or with the appropriate vaccine, making sure that we are not as vulnerable anymore to the virus. Um, so at that stage, and that to bring our, ourselves back to the the emerging market dimension, I mean, so so uh, so we will we will have seen. Um, uh, massive defaults in many many countries uh, of the emerging uh, emerging market world. Um, uh, I could imagine that uh, in in a year's time, let's say at the earliest in a year's time, when we get out of this immediate virus phase, um, quite a number of emerging markets will have been through some sort of a debt restructuring, um, and uh, global trade will have taken a very severe hit. Um, uh, how quickly can we think about the res resumption phase? I mean, uh, the, so the advanced economies will provide uh, fiscal support to, uh, to get a recovery going more or less strong. Um, and that's the big debate in Europe now, how strong can the European mechanism be so that the European recovery phase is strong. In the US, there will be um, a recovery package. In the emerging economies, um, there will be not much fiscal space to do a recovery. Um, there will even be a tendency to go for more self-insurance so that next time um, you're better prepared. So basically uh, uh, too little uh, uh, fiscal space, uh, too little uh, spending. So, so will we see a very subdued recovery in particular in the emerging market economies? I do fear that that will be the case that um, export-oriented emerging markets and developing countries will have a hard time given that recovery in the, in, in the advanced countries will be moderate, will be lethargic, in, in, in my view, will be sporadic if the virus returns and selective lockdowns and, and, and so forth uh, return uh, as well. Um, on the finance side, one thing that the crisis has done, I think, is reinforced, underscored the desirability of various kinds of indexed debt, debt payments on which depend on the health of the economy measured in, in 
different ways. So people have talked about uh, GDP growth indexed bonds. You pay more if your economy is grown robustly and less. If it's not bonds payments on which are indexed to particular commodity prices, why doesn't Chile have copper indexed bonds? Why don't oil exporting countries have petroleum indexed bonds? I think this crisis is, is an opportunity to get more of those instruments out there into the market. Um, uh, it's difficult for a country to move in that direction all by itself because it pays a novelty premium in order to do so, because the market for the, that kind of debt is not terribly broad and liquid. But if a bunch of countries now are going to have to restructure their debts and convert old instruments into new ones at a point in time when we're reminded that un the unexpected can happen and that we may be entering now into a even more volatile world than we had before. This is an opportunity to get those instruments into the market, which would be good both for developing countries and their creditors. And uh, Barry, I have a question from uh, Vincenzo Giannone, who is uh, asking if this period is uh, somehow similar to the 1930 45. Uh, he's pointing out high level of debt, asset inflation, high income, and wealth inequality. As uh, an expert on economic history, maybe we can, you can uh, have a little bit of a, um, of a comparison for our listeners as well to, to understand a little bit the situation. So no Zoom call with me would be complete without a comparison with the 1930s. Um, exactly. This crisis uh, is different in many important ways from the Great Depression of the 1930s. This started as a supply shock rather than a demand shock. This crisis started on the real side of the economy before beginning to migrate to the financial side. The Great Depression started on the financial side before uh, infecting, if you excuse the word, the, uh, the real side. Unemployment went up to 25% in the United States in four years between 1929 and 1933. We accomplished that, if accomplish is the right word, in four weeks this time rather than four years. So there are important differences. I think there are lessons that have been learned from that earlier crisis about responding forcefully with both monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, that lesson was embraced to an extent in 2008, 2009, and it's been embraced wholeheartedly this time. And I, for one, think that is all to the good. Um, there are other lessons about the premature withdrawal of stimulus, something we did in the United States in 1936-37, leading to a double dip recession in 1938. Uh, that too, I think is an important lesson that we want to think about now going forward. People are, are about to have, policymakers are about to have what Olivier Blanchard at the Peterson Institute calls their, oh my God, what have I done moment where they realize how heavy public debts are, will be mm. going forward. And I think there will be a, te a temptation to consolidate before the economy can support consolidation. That's another lesson of the 1930s. So if we can uh, perhaps one moment, sp spend one moment on this uh, fiscal and then monetary uh, policy interaction and um, perhaps zoom in a bit on the, on the US dollar. Uh, of course, uh, uh, one big dimension here is that it's uh, foreign currency borrowing um, that we are seeing, and uh, it's typically foreign currency borrowing uh, by emerging markets in dollars, right? It's not in euros, so it's in the international reserve currency, which is the US dollar. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, part of the, the, uh, the, the issue is uh, in the short term is um, do the emerging markets have enough um, access to liquidity, uh, US dollar liquidity? Uh, but then going forward, uh, since you mentioned um, 
index bonds, index to copper and, uh, and so on. I mean, copper prices, you could just as well think of um, uh, bonds in different currencies, in local currencies, um, uh, instead of the US dollar. Um, so I guess this, this whole thing, um, th this whole situation depends um, also quite a bit uh, and, and is quite a bit linked to the international role um, of the US dollar. And um, the policy response provided presumably will also have consequences on the future role of the US dollar um, and the extent to which countries will ever be willing to uh, uh, go uh, in uh, uh, borrow in 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 U.S. dollars um, instead of um, uh, uh, borrowing less and borrowing only in local currencies, or perhaps even borrowing in in uh, Chinese or European currency. Uh, so, so can you give us a sense on where you see the monetary policy responses to uh, to this, and uh, what you would advise the Fed and perhaps also the ECB to do? Um, and where you see um, the emerging economies um, after this? I think the Fed's response in the short run has reinforced the global role of the dollar because it uh, re-extended swap lines to the four emerging markets that it favored with swap lines in 2008, as well as um, to a bunch of, of advanced economies. It sweetened the terms of those swap lines, the amount of interest uh, that countries making use of them have to pay was reduced further. And for countries that are not favored with Federal Reserve swap lines, for whatever reason, one of the problems is nobody knows what the criteria the Fed uses to choose countries uh, in fact are. In addition, the Fed offered a, a treasury repo facility. So if a, a, if a central bank has US treasuries, it doesn't have to dump them uh, onto the market in order to uh, get cash in dollars, but it can repo them, uh, lend them and to the Fed in return for dollars and get them back later. Again, the problem here is this only works if you have lots of dollar reserves. It doesn't help sure. countries that are Short. That's where the IMF facility is supposed to step in, but the IMF facility is only extended to countries that effectively have dollars already. So we do have a problem here. Um, I think the only long-term solution is for the world to evolve in, in, in the direction of a more multipolar international monetary and financial system where the structure of the monetary and financial system better matches the multipolar nature of uh, the global economy. That means for Europe that uh, Corona bonds by another name would be positive for the globe and not, not only for Europe because it would create that kind of deep and liquid market in treasury securities that is one of the attractions of US treasury bonds, where Europe has a more balkanized uh, treasury market uh, uh, with different governments, with different degrees of credit standing behind their respective national bonds. I was in fact on a call with um, Governor Yi of the PBOC uh, a week and a half ago now, and I suggested that China could be part of the solution as well. China has swap lines, as you know, with a bunch of countries around the world, which it established partly to uh, in, in, in encourage regulators in the UK and France and elsewhere to allow banks to do more transactions in the Chinese currency. So if they, if they needed more renminbi, they could get their hands on them through, through these swap lines. I suggested China should up its game and increase uh, its renminbi swaps uh, as well. That would in turn encourage more business in renminbi and, and uh, central banks to hold more reserves in renminbi, which is another step in the direction of that multilateral system, more multipolar system. Well, yes, indeed. I think it would be very good um, on the speaking as a European if we uh, had some 
more European debt uh, fully backed by, by the ECB. And if the ECB, of course, also extended uh, more swap lines, at least to neighboring countries, I mean, that would certainly be, be a very positive step for Europe, but also for, for the global economy. But I think, uh, Giuseppe, we are coming uh, close to an end. Is there a, perhaps a final question that you want? Yeah, we're coming to... close, close to an end, but I would like to ask a question that uh, received quite a lot of uh, uh, likes on, on, uh, on, our, uh, on our system, on our platform. Um, could it be that the emerging markets will just accept the cost in terms of that, uh, that toll and in exchange uh, stay operational while the rich countries will, be, will tie themselves down? So, Giuseppe, um, you, you have to interpret that question a, a little bit. A little bit. So, basically, would, would we see lockdowns who are going to be ending much uh, much faster in emerging markets mm. and uh, uh, basically in order to keep the economy over there going and uh, as a counterpart of the fact that the uh, economy will slow down more on the on the global north well i do think there is a, a danger that in poor countries uh, the costs of lockdown will be high because so many people are living on the margin of subsistence because food delivery systems could be breaking down in the face uh, of these lockdowns. So we have pressure in the United States. Now we have pressure in the inland counties of California to end the, the lockdown, but that pressure will be more intense, uh, I'm sure, in low-income countries due to the problems I, I, I just described, that could be giving into that pressure. Uh, that pressure might be irresistible, but giving in could be catastrophic from a public health point of view as well. So what can be done about that? I think there are a lot of cases where um, uh, low-income countries will need quick help on the public health front. And as I said before, $14 billion from the World Bank is a small down payment on what needs to be done in terms uh, of, of providing not only uh, uh, assistance to public health systems, but food assistance and, and, and the like, which people will need in order to um, tolerate lockdowns and, and uh, engage in, in social distancing. Thank you very much, Professor Eikegren. Thanks a lot, uh, Guntram. And uh, of course, we are going to continue these conversations within the frame of our events and podcasts and also our publications and blogs on the website www.brugel.org. Until next time, bye-bye. And thank you very much, Barry. Thank you. This was thank great. You.